Good evening, everyone. My name is Madeline Schmidt. I am a junior rhetoric major at Hillsdale College, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Mr. Roger Kimball this evening. Roger Kimball is editor and publisher of the new Criterion and president and publisher of Encounter Books. A contributor to numerous publications, including the Epic Times, the Sunday Telegraph, the American Spectator, and American Greatness. Mr. Kimball is editor, co-editor, or author of numerous books, including Ithwart History, Half a Century of Polemics, Animadversions, and Illuminations, a William F. Buckley Jr. omnibus, The Long March, How the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s Changed America, Vox Populi, The Perils and Promises of Populism, and most recently, Who Rules? Sovereignty, Nationalism, and the Fate of Freedom in the 21st Century. Will everyone please welcome me in joining Mr. Roger Kimball. Thank you, Maddie. I thought you were going to say something about my fabulous bow tie. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be back at Hillsdale, a little oasis of sanity. <clears throat> well, since this conference is about the liberal arts and education today, and my own slice of that pie concerns freedom and education, I'd like to begin with a question. And it's one that I'd like you to keep in mind as the evening unfolds. The question is this. What is liberal about a liberal education? Now that question is not as easy to answer as you might think. For one thing, really to answer it, <clears throat> you have to know what the word liberal means. Can you think of any word that has accumulated more conflicting meanings than the word liberal. And then there's the word education. Who wants to give that one a try? In my experience, the more you think about those simple words, the more elusive are their meanings. In the materials distributed for this conference, there is a cheery quotation from James Madison co-author of the Federalist Papers and a principal author of the U.S. Constitution. Madison says that liberty and learning belong together. They support each other, he says, and further, their connection supports a free society. In various forms, the nexus between liberty and learning is a very traditional idea, one that has epistemological and existential, as well as political dimensions. Aristotle begins the book we call Metaphysics with the observation that all men by nature desire to know. Aristotle thought that learning freed us, gave us liberty from the snares of ignorance, illusion, and mere appearance. Learning, he thought, not only depends upon, but also begets certain freedoms. In the Gospel according to St. John, Jesus says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. In the Gospel, the relevant freedom is freedom from sin. But that point can be generalized, which is why various schools and colleges have adopted the saying as their motto. And it's perhaps worth noting that the CIA liked the quotation so much that they had it etched into a wall of their headquarters. It's amusing to speculate what the author of that saying would make of this spooky application of his words. The Greek word that the evangelist John uses for truth is aletheia, aletheia. Interestingly, it has a negative form, a, letheia. Etymologically, it means not forgetful. 
In Greek mythology, the river Lethe is a font of forgetfulness. Truth, Alethia, is the antidote to Lethe. Memory, in other words, is deeply implicated in the career of truth. So let's come back to the question, what is liberal about a liberal arts education? As Professor Kopf reminded us this afternoon in his excellent talk, the word liberal comes from the Latin word liber, which means free. The original reason that a liberal arts education was so prized was because it promised to free students from the rust of prejudice and presentism, the belief that the present moment is the summit of wisdom and enlightenment, and that accordingly, the past is nothing more than a graveyard of discredited and mostly malignant ideas. Is liberal education still liberal in that sense? I'd wager that everyone in this room knows George Santayana's observation that he who is ignorant of the past is destined to repeat it. That is one reason we put such stock by education. We believe that when successful, education can help rescue us from making the same mistakes that earlier generations had made. When I ponder the recent itinerary of education in this country, and not just college education, but the whole shebang, I often think of that old advertisement for a brand of cigarettes designed to appeal especially to women. You've come a long way, baby. How right they were. But a distance, a distance traveled is not necessarily a progress logged. It was not so long ago that Cardinal Newman's enumeration of the goals of a liberal education could have been taken as a motto by the American academic establishment. Newman said that the chief objects of a university education were, and I quote, a cultivated intellect, a delicate taste, a candid, equitable, dispassionate mind, a noble and courteous bearing in the conduct of life. That educational ambition was quite normal in the 1850s, but today, or consider the observation made by the philosopher John Searle that, quote, the idea that the curriculum should be converted to any partisan purposes is a perversion of the ideal of a university. The attempt to convert curricu the curriculum into an instrument of social transformation, he said, whether it be leftist, rightist, centrist, or whatever, is the very opposite of higher education. Until the day before yesterday, Searle's warning was regarded as common sense. Now, it is uncommon and highly provocative wisdom. How easy it is to forget the journey that led us into this situation. Now, I'm not suggesting that in the past, our educational institutions always lived up perfectly to the ideal that Newman enunciated, or that they always avoided the perversion against which Professor Searle warned, but they aspired to. Indeed, until at least the middle 1960s, there was robust agreement about the intellectual and moral goals of a liberal arts education, even if those goals seemed difficult to achieve. There was, for example, a shared commitment to the ideal of disinterested scholarship devoted to the preservation and transmission of knowledge, which meant the preservation and transmission of a civilization pursued in a community free from ideological intimidation. If we inevitably fell short of the ideal, the ideal nevertheless continued to command respect and to exert a guiding influence. The truth is 
that despite widespread concern about the fate of higher education, and despite many and various efforts to call attention and remedy it, the reality is, in many ways, far graver today than it was in the 1970s and 1980s, when exotic phenomena such as Afrocentrism, post-colonial studies, queer theory, critical legal studies, and the attack on science by anti-humanistic humanists was just beginning to gather steam. And despite the rise of alternative voices here and there, and since I'm at Hillsdale, let me stress the word here, those dominating the discussion at most institutions are committed to discrediting the traditional humanistic ideals of liberal education by injecting politics into the heart of the educational enterprise. Consider the phenomenon, the phenomena of multiculturalism and political correctness. And I always think of putting scare quotes around the word multiculturalism because really it is a form of monocultural animus directed against the dominant culture. The multiculturalists claim to be fostering a progressive cultural cosmopolitanism distinguished by superior sensitivity to the downtrodden and dispossessed. In fact, they encourage an orgy of self-flagellating liberal guilt as impotent as it is insatiable. Hence, the woke sensitivity of the multiculturalist is an index not of moral refinement, but of moral vacuousness. Multiculturalism is a paralyzing intoxicant. Its thrill centers around the emotion of superior virtue. Its hangover subsists on a diet of ignorance and blighted good intentions. The crucial thing to understand about multiculturalism is that notwithstanding its emancipationist rhetoric, it is not about recognizing general cultural diversity or encouraging pluralism. It is about undermining the priority of Western liberal values in our educational system and indeed in our society at large. In essence, as the political scientist Samuel Huntington pointed out, multiculturalism is, quote, anti-European civilization. It is basically, said Huntington, an anti-Western ideology. Now, the most ironical aspect of this whole spectacle is that what appears to its adherents as bravely anti-Western is, in fact, a part of the West's long tradition of self-scrutiny. Indeed, criticism of the West has been a prominent ingredient in the West's self-understanding, at least since Socrates invited his fellow Athenians to debate with him about the nature of the good life. No civilization in history has been as consistently self-critical as the West. In attacking Western civilization, the multiculturalist is also attacking the liberating spirit of self-scrutiny, replacing it with fashionable dog dogmas of indoctrination. Anti-Americanism occupies such a prominent place on the agenda of the culture wars precisely because the traditional values of American identity articulated by the founders and grounded in a commitment to individual liberty, limited government, and public virtue are deeply at odds with the radical, de-civilizing tenets of the multiculturalist enterprise of political correctness. A profound ignorance of the milestones of American, or indeed of any other culture, is one predictable result. The statistics have become proverbial. Huntington quotes one poll showing that while 90% of Ivy League students could identify Rosa Parks, only 25% could identify the author of the words, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Another survey revealed that 40% of seniors at 55 top colleges could not say within half a century when the Civil War was fought. The erosion of shared memory is such a potent tool of tyranny 
because it dissolves those links with the past that give substance to liberty. The founding father, James Wilson, was right when he observed that, quote, law and liberty cannot rationally become the object of our love unless they first become the objects of our knowledge. We must know the past in order to profit from its lessons. It almost goes without saying that the tenured or soon to be tenured radicals now controlling nearly all of the most prestigious humanities departments in this country reply that their critics have overstated the case. Really, they say, there is nothing amiss. Nothing has happened that need concern parents, trustees, alumni, government, or other private funding sources. On the issue of enforcing politically correct behavior on campus, for example, they will assure you that the whole thing has been overblown by conservative journalists who do not sufficiently admire multiculturalism and cannot appreciate that the free exchange of ideas must sometimes be curtailed for the higher virtue of protecting the feelings of designated victim groups. And the curriculum, they will say, has not been politicized. It has been merely democratized, opened up to reflect the differing needs and standards of groups and ideas hitherto insufficiently represented in the academy. The aim of such objections is not to enlighten or persuade, but to intimidate and to preempt criticism. The truth is that what we are facing today is nothing less than the destruction of the fundamental premises that underlie our conception both of a liberal education and of a liberal democratic polity. Respect for rationality and the rights of the individual, a commitment to the ideals of disinterested criticism and colorblind justice, advancement according to merit, not according to sex, race, or ethnic origin. These quintessentially Western ideas are bedrocks of our political as well as our educational system. And they are precisely the ideas that are now under attack by progressive academics, intoxicated by the coercive possibilities generated by their self-infatuating embrace of political correctness. Political correctness also fosters an atmosphere of intimidation and encourages a slavish moral and intellectual conformity, attacking the very basis for the free exchange of ideas. Even worse, it encourages a kind of intellectual sentimentality that makes it difficult to acknowledge certain unpalatable realities. The reality, for example, that not all cultures or indeed all individuals are equal in terms of potential or accomplishment. It insinuates that dreadful lie in the soul that Socrates warned about in the Republic. Politics, the late journalist Andrew Breitbart once observed, is downstream from culture. In the United States, a primary engine of culture is the educational establishment. Since the late 1960s, it has been anything but an ivory tower, a quiet, semi-cloistered readout, deliberately subsisting at one remove from partisan passions. On the contrary, the educational establishment in this country, and it, this goes for primary and secondary education as well as for colleges, has incorporated those partisan passions as part of its raison d'etre. The chief question is this. Should our institutions of higher education be devoted primarily to education of citizens? Or should they be laboratories for, the social, for social and political experimentation? Traditionally, a liberal arts education involved both character formation and learning. The goal was to produce men and women who, as Alan Bloom memorably put it, had reflected thoughtfully on the question, what is man in relation to his highest aspirations as opposed to his low and common needs? 
In recent decades, however, colleges and universities have more and more been home to what the literary critic Lionel Trillian called the adversary culture of intellectuals. The goal is rejection and repudiation, not reflection. Now the key issue, I, I hasten to add, is not partisan politics per se, but rather subordinating the subordinating of intellectual life to non-intellectual, that is to say, political imperatives. Indeed, it is this failure, a failure to check the colonization of intellectual life by politics, that stands behind and fuels the degradation of liberal education. The issue is less the presence of bad politics than the absence of non-politics in the intellectual life of the university. Now what has happened to the educational establishment cannot be understood from its cultural context, that long march through the institutions that the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci recommended and whose American lineaments I chronicled in my book, The Long March, How the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s Changed America. The age of Aquarius, I wrote in that book's introduction, did not end when the last electric guitar was unplugged at Woodstock. It lives on in our values and our habits and our tastes, pleasures, and aspirations. It lives on especially in our emotional and cultural institutions and in the degraded pop culture that permeates our lives like a corrosive fog. We have been seeing the results of this dissemination everywhere, in the media, in the corporate boardrooms, where resolutions deploring systemic racism are touted by quivering virtue signaling bureaucrats, throughout the federal government where workshops on critical race theory catechize government workers about the evils of whiteness and the glories of trans culture. And just this past summer on our city streets, where Antifa and the trained Marxists of Black Lives Matter rampaged under the protection of the First Amendment while endeavoring to destroy the political culture that underwrites such protections. It is a great irony that the free speech movement, <clears throat> which began in 1964 in the tumult of Berkeley, has over the years mutated into something close to the opposite, a kind of anti-free speech movement that approaches opinions with which it disagrees by attempting to cancel them. It is not at all uncommon on our nation's campuses to find academics decrying academic freedom in the name of a putatively higher virtue. At many institutions, liberal education has mutated into intolerant indoctrination. A similar process of mutation or reversal has been at work throughout the so-called liberal institutions of Western society. In the corporate boardrooms, no less than in the media, government bureaucracies, and such cultural institutions as museums. Indeed, the metastasis of illiberal liberalism beyond the protected purlieus of academia is one of the signal cultural deformations of our time. What it tokens is nothing less than the potential eclipse of that robust understanding of liberal society that has informed the self-understanding of the Anglosphere, at least from the time, time of Runnymede and the adoption of Magna Carta. At its core stand the ideals of free speech, religious liberty, and equality before the law. The repudiation of such values and the value of limited government, which is a political precondition for the thriving of those ideals, has underwritten the redefinition of liberalism from the championship of freedom to illiberal, politically correct conformity. It's perhaps worth pausing to remind ourselves that free speech does not exist in isolation. It is part of a constellation of freedoms that include, for example, freedom of conscience and the freedom implicit in the idea that all men are equal before the law. 
Those freedoms are, are or were bedrock principles in the modern secular West. But increasingly, they are up for grabs in a situation where dissent from orthodoxy is met not with disagreement, but with efforts at suppression, scapegoating, and ostracism. The entire army armory of so-called cancel culture. It is worth noting, too, how many new disciples of intolerance begin by proclaiming their allegiance to freedom only to redefine it out of existence. Freedom of speech is one thing, said one such campaigner, but use, usage of your freedom should not be to offend others or advocate hate speech or provoke people to violence. Note that little word, but. Freedom of speech is one thing, but, but what? A common marker in this debate is the phrase hate speech. We're supposed to say yes to free speech, but deplore hate speech. Speech, as one partisan of this milk toast version of free speech put it, that offends or insults in general. Now, of course, the law has long had statutes against speech that incites violence or that imperils public order, gratuitously crying fire in a crowded theater, for example. But the phrase hate speech is like that other item in the lexicon of less leftist redress, social justice. It is a weapon masquerading as a moral imperative. The adjective is cognitively vacuous, but emotionally charged. It injects an intoxicating dose of moral self-righteousness that, that clouds the head, even if it sets the heart a flutter. Now the large issue here is one that has bedeviled liberal societies ever since there were liberal societies. Namely, that in attempting to create the maximally tolerant society, we also give scope to those who would prefer to create the maximally intolerant society. It's the old Leninist credo in action. Demand freedom, toleration, and diversity when out of power. Practice suppression, control, and the elimination of opponents when in power. It's a curious phenomenon. Liberalism implies openness to other points of view, even, it would seem, to those points of view whose success would destroy liberalism. Extending tolerance to those points of view is a prescription for suicide. But intolerance betrays the fundamental premise of liberalism, namely openness. As Robert Frost once put it, a liberal is someone who refuses to take his own part in an argument. The escape from this disease of liberalism lies in understanding that tolerance and openness must be limited by positive values if they are not to be vacuous. American democracy, for example, affords its citizens great latitude, but great latitude is not synonymous with the proposition that anything goes. Alan Bloom put it well. The fact, he wrote in the closing of the American mind, that there have been different opinions about good and bad in different times and places in no way proves that none is true or superior to others. Our society, like every society, is founded on particular positive values. The rule of law, for example, respect for the individual, religious freedom, the separation of church and state. Or think of that robust liberalism expressed by Sir Charles Napier, the British commander in India in the early 19th century. Told that immolating widows on fu the funeral pyres of their husbands was a cherished local custom, Napier said, very well, we also have a custom. When, a, when men burn a woman alive, we tie a rope around their necks and we hang them. <laughs> build your funeral pyre. Beside it, my carpenters will build a gallows. You may follow your custom, then we will follow ours. The point is that the openness that liberal society rightly cherishes is not a vacuous openness to all points of view. It is not value neutral. 
It need not, indeed, it cannot say yes to all comers, to the Islamo-fascist who, after all, has his point of view just as much as the soccer mom who has hers. Western democratic society is rooted in a particular vision of what Aristotle called the good for man. The question is, the question is, do we as a society still have confidence in the animating values of that vision? Do we possess the requisite will to defend them? Or was the French philosopher Jean-Francois Revel right when he said that democratic civilization is the first in history to blame itself because another power is trying to destroy it? The jury is still out on these questions, and how they are answered will determine the future not only of Western universities, but also of that astonishing spiritual political experiment that is Western democratic liberalism. That liberalism is embodied in the virtues of disinterestedness and impartiality, the unbiased discernment of truth. It is symbolized, for example, by the statue of justice adorning our courthouses, blindfolded and holding a scale to declare her allegiance to law, not men. It is implicit in Martin Luther King Jr.'s observation that what matters is not the color of your skin, but the content of your character. The entire premise of Black Lives Matter is antithetical to the aspirations of equality in King's hopeful sense. Indeed, with its angry codicil that asserting all lives matter is racist and therefore impermissible, the BLM movement is an inversion of King's message just as it is an affront to the ideal of impartiality on which the rule of law depends. But the attack on that ideal long predates the BLM movement. It is woven deeply into the culture of repudiation that fueled the radicalism of the 1960s and undermined the humanistic tradition that, once upon a time, our universities existed to foster and hand down. The cultural critic Christopher Lash diagnosed it with great clarity. A misplaced compassion, Lash wrote in his posthumously published book, The Revolt of the Elites, degrades both the victims who are reduced to objects of pity and their would-be benefactors who find it easier to pity their fellow citizens than to hold them up to impersonal standards, attainment of which would entitle them to respect. Lash, an old-fashioned liberal, understood that embracing democracy does not entail a debasement of standards. Equality, rightly understood, requires a respect for impartial canons of achievement. This insight lay at the center of Matthew Arnold's culture and anarchy. Culture, as Arnold regarded it, does not try to teach down to the level of inferior classes. It seeks to do away with classes, to make the best that has been thought and known in the world current everywhere. Hence it is, Arnold wrote, that the men of culture are the true apostles of equality. The great men of culture are those who have had a passion for diffusing, for making prevail, for carrying from one end of society to the other the best knowledge, the best ideas of their time. Today, of course, the contention that some ideas are better than others, let alone that some deserve to be called the best, is rejected as an elitist crime against diversity. The cult, or the ideology of diversity, what we have baptized as identity politics, which represents the systematic rejection of everything connected with impartiality and objective impersonal standards, is the enabling presupposition of the destructive cauldron of racialist obsession in which our society is now marinating. The irony is that our current intolerance is the perverted progeny of the primary liberal value of openness. 
It used to be, to quote Alan Bloom one last time, that openness was the virtue that permitted us to seek the good by using reason. It now means accepting everything and denying reason's power. The unrestrained, unrestrained and thoughtless, thoughtless pursuit of openness, he concludes, has rendered openness meaningless. If you doubt this, you could turn in, tune in to the evening news and listen to fancy people explain why destroying someone else's property is not violence, while keeping one's own counsel and refusing to join in the mob in ritual orgies of denunciation and self-abasement is violence. A couple of concluding observations. In his book, Notes Toward the Definition of Culture, T.S. Eliot noted that, quote, culture is the one thing we cannot deliberately aim at. It is the product of a variety of more or less harmonious activities, each pursued for its own sake. For its own sake. That is one simple idea that is everywhere in peril today. When we plant a garden, it is bootless to strive directly for, for camellias. They are the natural product of our care, nurture, and time. We can manage it still when it comes to agriculture. When we turn our hands to cultura animi, to the cultivation of the soul, we seem to be considerably less successful. Let me end by noting that the opposite of conservatism or conservative is not liberal, but ephemeral. Russell Kirk once observed that he was conservative because he was liberal, that is, committed to freedom. Kirk's formulation may sound paradoxical, but it touches on a great truth. To be conservative, that means wanting to conserve what is worth preserving from the ravages of time and ideology, evil and stupidity, so that freedom may thrive. In some plump eras, the task is so easy, we can almost forget how necessary it is. At other times, the enemies of civilization transform the task of preserving our, our culture into a battle for survival. And that, I believe, and I say it regretfully, is where we are today. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, entertain comments, questions, yes. and animadversions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kimball. Um, Mr. Kimball has agreed to sign copies of his book, Who Rules? Sovereignty, Nationalism, and the Fate of Freedom in the 21st Century, following this session on the second floor of Cyril. Um, we now have some time for a Q&A. Please make your way down the aisle if you have a question. So I've noticed a lot of schools similar to Hillsdale have a very small student body, while the schools that maybe advocate for some of these degenerative educational practices have a really high student body. And I was wondering if there's a way we can prevent the masses from having such poor education if schools like this are very, uh, very few and far between. I would say that Hillsdale is unique, not just unusual. But um, unfortunately, it's worse than your question suggests because many of the very worst petri dishes incubating this disease are small schools. All of the top, all, I believe, all of the you know, so-called top liberal arts uh, fancy schools, especially in the East for some reason. Uh, they may have a student body of a couple thousand or a few thousand. They're small. They're expensive. They have too much money. But they are assiduous in 
promulgating all of the worst aspects of this cultural revolution that I intimated. They're just as bad as the huge schools, and in fact, worse, uh, because the large schools, while they may be intellectually less distinguished, uh, are in many cases given over to other pursuits. They're not really concerned with liberal arts education, although they may say so when they send out their fundraising letters and so on. What they're really concerned about, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, uh, is a kind of vocational education, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's, they are not really part of the, uh, of the effort to pass on this liberal tradition I was talking about. So I think it's, uh, it's not just a matter of numbers. It's, it's really a matter of quality. Thank you for uh, coming, Mr. Kimball. I think I started reading uh, the new Criterion and my father would earmark it for me probably by the time I was 14 or so. And I don't know, has anybody ever, maybe it's the bow tie. I think you bear some resemblance to Duncan Stroik, the chapel architect. I don't know, if, did anybody else notice that? Actually, he's my twin. <laughs> Makes sense. I, I just want to ask, um, you mentioned that uh, for it's not the idea that uh, education ought to be free from ideological bent itself and, or, and ideological or philosophical, if you'll forgive the equivocation, uh, proposition when considered in the context of the modern state. So I say the modern state in contrast to the ancient or medieval, medieval regimes, which just did not have the power to be so all-encompassing in terms of state or government um, involvement in education. Um, so for example, uh, today, Hillsdale's independence from government seems to imply an ideological bent when ideally it wouldn't, uh, right? Well, every society and indeed every common pursuit depends upon an affirmation of uh, certain values. And there is a sense in which that affirmation is political. But when it comes to liberal education, the political affirmation turns importantly on the idea that none of us has a monopoly on the truth and therefore it is a good thing to foster a community where people can follow the argument according to their own best lights and talk about it with other people and debate it. That is not a political activity, although it depends upon a previous decision that being able to engage in that kind of free debate is a worthwhile thing to do. So, uh, when people say, well, it's a, Hillsdale is just as politicized as Yale or Williams or something, because their decision to be free from government intrusion is a political act. And there's some truth to that, but where that falls down, I think, is in failing to recognize that by essentially taking yourself out of the influence of people who want to rule the way in which you conduct yourselves, uh, you have not become slaves to somebody else, but are free. So it seems to me that it's, um, you, you often see people make this rhetorical move. They'll say, well, you know, isn't that just as political as uh, being non-political? And you saw this, for example, in the, the phrase, uh, I alluded to it, although I don't think I quoted it, uh, this summer, uh, people would say, silence is violence. Well, no it isn't. Violence is violence. <laughs> silence is, is silence. And uh, this, the kind of metabolism of this uh, phenomenon that you're talking about is something that it's, 
is very important to be alert to because it's used, uh, not in good faith, but it's used as a sort of bludgeon to try to make it impossible to pursue uh, a genuinely liberal arts education and beyond that, to pursue a genuinely liberal society where people live together because they affirm certain basic values about the nature of their society, but are otherwise free to pursue their lives and to disagree and uh, um, uh, in, engage in public spirited debate. We are in a situation now, not just in, in our educational lives, but in the life of this country where uh, d d dissent is regarded as a kind of criminal act. And it's uh, instead of, it's, it's sort of like heresy. And down that path is a very, very dangerous end. Uh, I think we still have time to step back from the abyss, but we are close to the abyss. Thanks for your talk. Um, so there are kind of two sides here. We have diversity and multiculturalism, which I don't think are necessarily inherently bad, but they do have to be balanced with preserving a homogenous national culture necessary to sustain a country. Um, so there's a tension there. How much nuance would you introduce into that conversation? If, if I understood your question, it's... Uh, Multiculturalism is not necessarily bad because it, it, it provides diversity and that sort of thing. Well, the problem is that what goes under the name of multiculturalism is not, there's no multi about it. It really is a kind of, as I said, I think of sort of a monocultural um, uh, uh, passion. So if you actually look at what is being um, taught as multicultural, you'll find that really it's just a series of cliches. The people who are promulgating it don't know, for example, other languages. If you really wanted to be multicultural, you would, you would learn the languages of these other cultures that you were uh, you know, pretending to talk about. But no, it's really, it's, it's a kind of fancy polysyllabic form of uh, uh, monocultural passion. At least that's how I have experienced it whenever I've looked into, uh, into the way in which it's actually promulgated on campuses. It's, it's taught not as a way of learning about other cultures, but as a way of undermining Western culture. It's all cultural, all cultures are equal, except they're all superior to the West. It's a kind of version of what Orwell talked about in uh, Animal Farm. All cultures are, all animals are equally, so, but some are more equal than others. Question to the speaker's left. Hi, uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Kimball. Um, this kind of speaks to the question that was just asked, but um, in your speech you discussed how multiculturalism and pluralism have corrosive effects on our education and our society at large, but um, I was wondering, is there a seed of good or something valuable in these ideas? Um, and in other words, um, what does the non-Western world have to teach us? Well, the non-Western world might have a lot to teach us, but um, it's been my experience, first of all, that uh, what goes under the banner of multiculturalism actually doesn't really learn very much about the non-Western world. And secondly, it seems to me that as Americans, we want to be able to affirm who we are first before pretending to uh, A, criticize our society, and B, adopt as if we are sort of a vacationing uh, other cultures. Um, I think if you actually look at what is taught in, in uh, colleges 
under the banner of multiculturalism. You'll find that most often it's composed very largely of anti-Western animus rather than genuine intellectual curiosity about other cultures. Um, that said, I think it's important to understand that, I, I think I mentioned this just in passing, that all cultures really are not equal. And, you know, uh, Saul Bellow got into a lot of trouble when he asked, where's the Tolstoy of the Zulus? People didn't like that. But that is not an illegitimate question, it seems to me. Now, there might be. There might be a great uh, a novelist of the Zulus. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's important to be able to tell the truth about things and to call things by their real names. And I think that there's a great sentimentality among some Americans about the virtues of other cultures that the more you look at them, the less justified that seems. A, a, uh, um, a novelist who was very brilliant, I think, uh, and brutal about exposing that was uh, V.S. Naipaul, who himself was from uh, Trinidad, I think, and really understood a lot about other cultures, but he also understood the toxic effects of sentimentalizing those cultures, especially for, for uh, people from the West. Hello, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this kind of relates to an earlier question, so I apologize for repeating anything here. Uh, but one thing you mentioned was how the uh, apolitical has become politicized, um, and the intellectual kind of the political is entering into it. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little more, uh, what do we do about this? So, for example, uh, a book like Huckleberry Finn, which could be put in a great books curriculum, uh, it's now become a political statement to, to put it in the curriculum in a way that it wasn't not too long ago. Um, so is there a way we have to depoliticize the apolitical, or are, is it too late for that? Is, um, what can we do to recover just reading Huck Finn because it's a great book um, and for no other political aim other than that? Uh, yeah, that, I think that's a very good question. Um, what we can do is say quite frankly to the people who say, we're offended by uh, Huckleberry Finn or uh, Othello or teaching Chaucer, who's after all a dead white guy. Some famous college has just uh, taken Chaucer out of its curriculum. Is to say no. We are, go we are going to, uh, the fact that you're offended uh, offends me. And so we're not going to, uh, we're not going to um, submit to this politically correct effort at intimidation. Instead, we are going to look to the past for the criterion of literary, artistic, cultural achievement. Why? Well, David Hume said, what, what is a work of genius? And he said, it's durable appreciation. Those works that have been appreciated for a long time. And of course now th that phenomenon changes. You know, th things go in and out of, uh, out of uh, fashion. You know, it was a, in the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, people like Shelley and Byron thought Tasso was terrific. Very few people read Tasso anymore. Um, there was a, 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 a time when Walter Scott was uh, thought to be, you know, uh, top dog when it came to novelists. I think Scott is not really read that much anymore. But the point is, these matters of taste, I think, should be determined by impartial standards. By, I mean, taste, you know, taste is an interesting thing, isn't it? Uh, it's pretty clear, Immanuel Kant pointed this out in his Critique of Judgment. There's different kinds of taste. You might like your 
steak well done, I might like mine rare. That's a kind of aesthetic judgment, aesthetic meaning uh, having to do with sensation. But we, we understand that, that the sort of taste that's involved in literary judgment is something different. And what is different about that? Well, Kant has his little schema. Uh, actually, it's not so little, but he has, a, he has a way of explaining that. But it's to basically appeal to a larger community. And he says that, that, um, that aesthetic judgment in that sense has an ennobling, an enlarging effect. Well, that, that's you know, obviously a, a hint of a, of a long discussion. Why is it, we, you might ask, why do we think that works of art are important? Clearly we do because we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars building museums and acquiring works of art. Why do we think education is important? Again, clearly we do. We need to, I mean, there are 4,500 institutions of, of education, higher education in this country. So we think that there's something important about it, even if to some very large extent we've sort of lost sight of that. But it seems to me that the most important loss is exactly what you're talking about, being able to judge these works on their own terms. That's why I, I mentioned at the, uh, uh, toward the end that you, you do something for its own sake. It's not for some ulterior utilitarian motive. It's because it's a good work of art. And uh, um, again, there's always going to be discussion disagreement about that, but that's what makes life interesting, the, that kind of disagreement. To have someone say, no, you can't read this because it has words I don't approve of in it, that's not on, I would say. Thank you, Mr. Kimball. We have time for one final question. Hello, thank you for um, your comments tonight. Uh, my question is related to the religious language you used, um, specifically with um, some of the opponents of liberal education. And with that level of uh, commitment to their ideas and devaluation of reason um, in dialogue, what do you see or what do you prescribe as a means to combat that for people that would adhere to reason as being the superior means uh, to, to go about these issues? Are you opposing reason to religion, or? Uh, no, so no. When, you were, when you were speaking of some of uh, the contemporary um, ideas, you, you used language like baptized and oh, things mm -hmm. like that. And, and I think rightly, there is like a religious element of this. Um, but, but in that, they've devalued reason um, in a way that makes it hard for people that are liberals in, in another sense to use reason to combat it. So what would you prescribe for me, a means to combat something that is religious in nature and antithetical to using reason. Okay, so I mean, sort of the, the, the uh, cult kind of, uh, yeah. Well, I think, first of all, the, the first step is recognizing what something is and calling it by its real name, as I just said to the last uh, chap. Um, you know, there's a, a book by a man named Norman Cohn, called The Pursuit of the Millennium. And it's all about these medieval, uh, you know, movements that like the, 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 the brotherhood of the free spirit, people who felt that they um, uh, had somehow achieved a higher level of virtue than the other people in their society. And this, it, this enabled them to do all kinds of things. Like they, they were not bound anymore by the normal morality of the people who were not enlightened. They could do whatever they want because they, they, they occupied a higher plane of, of enlightenment and a direct connection, so they thought, with, with the Godhead. Uh, you know, they might say that all material, the whole material world is evil, uh, except since I understand that, I'm no longer bound by the, the normal codes of morality. If that sounds a lot like what happened in the 1960s, you're quite right. It's also what happened, by the way, in the French Revolution. Why was it, why was it that uh, Robespierre, the, the uh, disciple of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, why was it that the word virtue was always on his lips? He took that word and that concept 
from Rousseau. And uh, it, the idea being that he wanted to create a virtuous society. Society was not virtuous, Robespierre thought, so we have to get rid of certain pe the people who are unvirtuous, in my sense, said Robespierre, uh, they have to be gotten rid of. So the index of uh, 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 virtue for the French Revolution was the rapidity with which the guillotine got rid of those who were not virtuous. It's a, um, uh, it's, it's a, a, poisonous, a poisonous idea and um, Again, you don't have to look very far in our society to see that kind of sentiment at work. Uh, if you pay attention to the rhetoric of uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, or Antifa, or uh, certain um, me members of that large building in Washington that's now surrounded by a 12-foot fence and razor wire, um, you, you hear scary echoes of that kind of, of thing. They're virtuous and you're not. And they believe that with a religious fervor uh, which does not invite conversation or disagreement, uh, but like any heresy, it invites uh, um, condemnation and uh, being stamped out. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kimball.